What's up guys, hope you had a good weekend. What an epic weekend of motorsport it was. Berlin E-Prix on Saturday, Monaco Grand Prix Sunday, followed by the Indy 500. Absolutely awesome if you're a motorsport fan. Uh, today's bank holiday in the UK, so we've got Claire and the kids at home, along with the dogs as well. So we're having a lovely day, hope you are too. Loads of questions though around motorsport from this weekend. So let's crack on with it. Right, let's get cracking then, because we've got loads to get through. We'll get through as many as we can. And we'll start with this one from Alan Murphy, and there's another one that goes with it. But Alan says, Hi Mark, why do you think Lewis did not let Max pass him with two laps to go? Surely over the season, Seb will be his biggest threat. So Max finishing five seconds ahead of Seb, but less than five seconds ahead of Lewis uh, would have been perfect for Lewis. Well, the problem with that, Alan, is that it's way too risky a strategy. Um, and you're referring, of course, to the fact that Max had a five second penalty. So if Lewis had released him with a couple of laps to go, perhaps he could have maintained a less than five second gap to Max out front meaning that when the five second penalty was applied, Mac would slot back in behind Lewis and ahead of Seb. That's what you're suggesting. Way too risky though. Lewis was on tyres that were shot to bits. Uh, he had no idea really of the true pace of Max behind him. And even with a couple of laps to go, if he'd released Max into the lead, he had no idea whether Max could actually extend the lead further than five seconds. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that there's no way you will ever get Lewis Hamilton or any driver to give up P1 in the Monaco Grand Prix with uh, a couple of laps to go. Uh, they're just not wired that way. They all want to win Monaco more than anything. So, so that was the reason. Two reasons. Too risky, and you'll never give get a, get a driver to give up a win on that basis. That he may be able to score a few more points. I think Lewis has got Seb pretty well covered by this point in the season anyway. And on a similar kind of note, uh, Lewis Dunk uh, Lewis Dobson says, I was wondering during the race if it would be smart for Ferrari to slow Bottas down to ensure Verstappen took points off Mercedes and closed the gap uh, that Ferrari had to Mercedes, would this have been too risky? Always enjoy your insight, keep up the amazing work. Thank you very much, Lewis. Yeah, too risky. Similar kind of thing. Should Ferrari have backed Bottas away to try and allow Max to slot in between them? It's just too risky. There's no way you can judge that accurately enough, particularly around a circuit like Monaco, um, it's just too risky a strategy, so those are the reasons why. Um, let's go with this one, Duncan Brown. Do you think Hamilton's constant radio messages to the team about his tyres encouraged Red Bull to push harder? Is this a sign that Hamilton still needs to mature in some aspects of his race communications? Have you ever heard a driver whine as much as Hamilton? Um, well, I don't think Lewis is a whiny driver. I genuinely don't. You know, having worked with him from experience, he's not a whiner. I think that's a little unfair. Um, I'm a big fan of Lewis Hamilton in terms of I have massive respect for him as a driver. However, I think what was going on yesterday, and we've seen this many times before, I've experienced it, you know, in my time working with him as well. He will he, he wasn't just communicating with the team at that point, he's communicating with everybody at home, with us. Uh, and I think he was doing that because he knew he was on tires that were were dead, and therefore his lap time was incredibly slow. I imagine in Lewis's mind, he's thinking to the, the rest of the world are looking on thinking, why is Lewis Hamilton going so slowly? Why has he got the, this queue forming behind him where he's backing everybody up? And I think he feels in his own mind a need to explain that to everybody at home. So that's why I think he constantly says, the tyres are destroyed, you know, this is becoming harder and harder, I can't continue because it just explains to everybody why, why he's doing what he's doing and, and also makes his drive looked more like a hero drive when the world knows that his tyres are destroyed and he's doing it up against this real challenge that he's facing within the cockpit. So I don't think it's naive from Lewis. I don't think it's immature. I think actually Lewis drove a very mature race yesterday because he had a, a very difficult car to drive in difficult circumstances and yet he did exactly what he needed to do. He positioned his car in the perfect places. He knew that if he did, it, it did his job right, there's no way Max or anybody else could get past him. And that's exactly what he did. He did enough to win the Monaco Grand Prix, which is all you can do there. So I think Lewis did a great job yesterday, a mature drive and a, and a, a kind of a measured drive from Lewis. But I don't think the radio communication was, uh, was immature or naive on Lewis's part. Um, Rick Beerendonk says, do you agree with the two penalty points that Verstappen got after his team released him unsafely? Was it safer to run closer to the other team's crews? Um, so the two penalty points that Max got were 
because once he was released by the team, which of course isn't his fault, that's the team doing that, and he came out, he made contact with Bottas, did he? But then he ran alongside him all the way along the pit lane, uh, potentially endangering people in the pit lane was the thinking of the FIA, or thinking of the stewards rather. And that's why he got two penalty points. They suggested he should have maybe backed out at that point and conceded the place. Um, so I can understand from that perspective why he got the two penalty points. In terms of the, fi uh, the, the five second penalty, I also kind of agree that you, the stewards didn't have a lot of choice in that because it ruined Bottas's uh, race to a large extent. However though, if I was in that Red Bull team, if I was the guy controlling the lights on Max Verstappen's pit stop, I'd have probably done exactly the same. Because Monaco's so hard to judge that. It's the hardest circuit we go to, A, because the pit lane's so tight and you've got crews either side of you, so your visibility is terrible, but also because track position's so important that if he were to wait, if he did hold Max in the pit lane, he might have lost five seconds anyway by waiting for two, three or four cars to get through before he then released him into the gap. And the risk of losing your track position over the risk of potentially getting that penalty I'd have probably done exactly the same. And bearing in mind, that thought process is like that. So I don't blame the Red Bull team for releasing him when he did, but I also don't blame the stewards for giving them the penalties they did because I don't think they had much choice. Paul Gilbert, it baffles me why teams allow their drivers to block when on a warm-up or cool-down lap during qualifying. Surely, when fighting for every tenth, it would make sense to dictate... Uh, to dedicate an engineer to manage this as blocking generally results in some kind of time penalty. Well, Paul, the teams don't allow their drivers to do it, and there is somebody who's absolutely managing that process. We don't hear all the radio communications on the TV broadcast, but the engineer is constantly telling their driver when there's a driver on a hot lap coming up behind them to give them as much warning as they can. Monaco, though, is just an incredibly difficult place to, to be able to manage that. From a driver's point of view, you, the, the track's not very wide, there are very few places where you can actually move over and let a driver through without impeding them in some aspect. And from a team engineer's point of view, the, the, the gaps between drivers can change, or concertina if you like, so much around the lap like Monaco where it's so slow and tight and twisty and very short bursts of acceleration. Drivers don't get much warning visually that someone's coming up on, or on which side they're coming up, they appear out of nowhere very quickly. So it's a very difficult circuit to manage and I think on that basis we have to give them a little bit of leeway, more so in Monaco than anywhere else. But they certainly don't allow their drivers to, to block, that's, that's the last thing they want to do from either perspective, the team or the drivers uh, front. Uh, Barath Nag says, Hi Mark, for the last few years I've heard many teams say that they have a fundamental issue with their cars. What exactly do they mean by fundamental? Why are the teams unable to fix it within a calendar year? Well, fundamental can mean a lot of things, can't it? But if we look at, let's say, the Williams this year, who clearly have a fundamental problem, it's a designed-in core problem with the car. It's a, a conceptual design problem. Something that's not as easy to fix as just redesigning a, a new front wing or making some suspension tweaks or setup changes. It doesn't work like that. So it's a baked-in problem, and you've got to remember that the design of these cars started, well, over a year ago. And so if they want to redesign a car because of a fundamental issue, then that's a huge amount of lead time, a huge amount of energy and time and resource that has to go into that if you take that decision. And not only does that take time in bringing that to the racetrack in this year, but it also affects the design process that's already underway for next year's car. So you have to really weigh that up. If you think about McLaren last year, if you saw my video when the McLaren for this year was launched, I explained about the fundamental problem that McLaren had last year that they only found late on and the reasons why they couldn't repair that or, or redesign the car midway through the season because it's finan it's a huge amount of cost but it's you know, more importantly for a Formula 1 team than that it's just a huge amount of resource that has to go in it that costs you time in this year's championship but also can affect next year's car so you have to make that very difficult decision of treating this year as a damage limitation year uh, and try to focus everything on fixing it for the following year rather than trying to rescue something this year that, that actually may not be rescuable. Uh, Rohan Thakra says, why aren't points awarded from first down to 20th place? Seems pointless for drivers in 15th place and below to compete for places towards the end of a race. Well, it is literally pointless and I kind of agree with you because on one hand I can say, you can say that you know a team like Williams that has had a terrible car this year 
you could say, well, they don't deserve to be awarded championship points. And that's a fair argument. But on the other side of that, if you think about towards the end of a race, the drivers that are outside of the points and well outside the points have nothing really to race for. And so they kind of, what's their motivation to still fight right to the end? Whereas if they were all awarded points, they could be fighting for an extra point or an extra two points. And that could bring the race or keep the race alive for longer all the way through the field. So on that basis, I kind of agree that that's probably what we should do. Alex Popescu says, uh, Hi Mark, what exactly is track evolution? I just realised the F1 commentators talk about it all the time, but I don't know what it really entails. They lay down rubber on the track. So do drivers feel that and can they brake later? Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the one of the issues or one of the um, effects of track evolution. Track evolution kind of just means the changes that the track goes through over the course of an event or over the course of a race. And that can be anything from the fact that, that rubber is constantly being laid down. At a circuit like Monaco, where they don't race on it that often, that has an even bigger evolution because the track is so low grip to start with. The more and more F1 cars and Formula 2 cars that go down put rubber down into the tarmac. It fills up the tiny little micro holes, if you like, or pores within the tarmac surface with rubber over the course of a race weekend. That builds up and builds up and rubber of the tyres connecting with rubber on the racetrack gives a much higher grip level in the dry uh, than it would rubber to tarmac. So the speeds start to increase. You can start to brake later. You can corner faster. You get better traction out of those corners as well because of that rubber to rubber um, you know the forces that can be transmitted through that differing grip level so that's one thing but track evolution can also be things like the cars cleaning up a racing line and that can mean them getting rid of things like leaves tree sap and moisture that might be falling from overhanging trees onto the racetrack over time it can be the dirt and grime and general traffic grime at a place like monaco on a street circuit where there are cars running round um, you know most of the time and just dropping general dirt, dust, rubbish, oil, all sorts of rubbish that comes off road cars, that can take a while for that to surface to, to clean up as the Formula One cars go over it. Uh, evolution can also refer to things like temperature. As the sun goes down, for example, at the Bahrain Grand Prix, where the surface temperature is much higher at the start of the race, it evolves and the temperature comes down as the sun disappears and it becomes darkness towards the end of the race and that temperature evolution can really have an impact on how tyres behave and therefore the performance of the car. So track evolution can mean a lot of different things but it talks really about how the track changes and what characteristics those track changes can have on the performance levels of the car. Uh, Van Archie says, why do teams practice starts in the pit lane? Surely they'll be unrepresentative of the grid position. Uh, do teams try to guess how the pit lane surface compares to the grid slot? Uh, yeah, they kind of have to guess, but it's not, you know, most people don't guess in Formula 1. It's a very considered um, and calculated guess based on data that they've acquired from the practice starts in the pit lane. Now, the practice in the pit lane because at most circuits you don't ever get the opportunity to practice starts on the grid until right before the race. In Monaco and some other tracks that's different. Of course we get the opportunity occasionally at the end of a practice session to do practice starts on the grid. But when we don't get the chance to do that at most tracks you've got to do it in the pit lane because it's your only opportunity. And even though it may not be exactly the same surface or exactly the same grip levels at that point you still get a huge amount of data from every start you can do, from the way the clutch is behaving, the way the driver is behaving in terms of the paddles and, and how your changes can affect all of that. And yeah, you have to take that data, extrapolate it from that particular practice start and try to transmit it or transform it to what will happen when they're on the grid. And then we get our final practice start as the cars go for the green flag lap before the race. And that's the best one. That's the most representative one of conditions at that time and of course your actual grid slot and those are when we get the data from that they analyze it very quickly while the cars are doing their their green flag lap and feed back information to the driver in terms of how that practice start looked compared to what they've been used to whether they need to make any slight tweaks so that's where it happens but that data is gradually built up right throughout the weekend and the pit lane practice starts are very very important even though they may not be absolutely representative of what will happen on sunday uh, Kevin Vora says, Hi Mark, how much does a third driver who does a lot of simulator work make a difference in an F1 car and does, ex does an experienced driver in that role help more in car performance? Yeah, absolutely. It's become more and more important. <laughs> 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 
it's become more important as in recent times because we've got less track testing. Wait. We've got less track testing, of course, now, real track testing, so simulator work's become more important. And what happens now is that drivers do our practice sessions, the two one and a half hour practice sessions on a Friday, and at the same time, and certainly Friday evening, after those sessions are finished, the simulator driver is back at the factory running a number of simulations based on the feedback from the actual race drivers and the data that's been collected on track at that particular circuit throughout the day. Now when the driver comes back in at the end of the Friday, shush, wait. When a driver comes in at the end of the day and talks to his engineer and they discuss what changes could be possibly made for Saturday, you know, it's all very well discussing those and looking at data, but they have the option with a, an experienced simulator driver to run those changes in the simulator, to try them out, to see what effect it has. And, a, and an experienced simulator driver can have a, a real big impact when he tries those and gives proper, decent, experience-based feedback as to what those changes have done to the car. So they'll be changing setup tweaks and he can talk about how that affects tyre wear and tyre performance and all manner of things like that. And we've seen a number of teams, F1 teams, have their weekends transformed because of work that the simulator driver has done back at the factory on the other side of the world on a Friday night after the cars have run on a Friday at the circuit. So very, very important and can make a huge difference. And that's why teams now are employing really experienced drivers to be their simulator driver, um, you know, as opposed to the drivers they've got in their actual race cars. Uh, Evan Danger Craig says, I'm wondering if you know why at the Indy 500 the drivers don't hold the wheel straight when the car is. Sure, they run on a separate type of suspension for the 500, but surely they could just re-centre the wheel to counteract this. Wouldn't it be more natural for the drivers? Um, so what, what Evan's talking about there is at the 500, when you're seeing the cars along the straight, or the straightaway, um, you've got the drivers sitting with the steering wheel. Excuse the dogs, they're being very noisy. The driver going down the straight is sitting with the steering wheel like this in the car, and it looks really strange um, to those who are not used to it. But the reason is that... At the 500, on a massive oval, high-speed oval like that, the corners at either end of the oval are such long duration, such high-speed and high-loading corners, that that's actually a, probably the majority, or certainly a large part, of the lap. Certainly one of the most important and most difficult parts of the lap for a driver. And so, when they're in the corners, the steering wheel is much more straight. And that's because that when the steering's straight like that, and balanced in front of your arms, to put equal loading through the wheel and hang on to it for such a long duration, it's much easier to do it when the steering wheel is like that. If the steering wheel is like that, you can imagine it's much easier or much more difficult to keep a balanced loading through your arms with one tucked underneath you and one over the top. When they're like this, it's much easier to hold on to the car at such a high loading rate through those long duration corners. So that's kind of why they do it, but I agree it looks kind of strange to those of us who are not used to it when they're going down the straight like that. Simon Zanet says, uh, Hi Mark, most of the time we hear drivers complaining it's very difficult to follow in the corners. Uh, how come in yesterday's race the top four drivers were maintaining a gap of 1.5 seconds or less between each other? Is it due to the slow race pace that Lewis was managing? I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. Uh, keep up the good work. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, yes, you've hit the nail on the head. It was exactly that. Lewis was driving at such a slow pace that he backed up the guys behind him into a concertina effect and nobody was at the absolute limit of their cars during that period. So they're not limited by the aero problems that we see at some other tracks. Um, I mean, also Monaco is just a very slow circuit. It's, a, it's not an aero limited circuit anyway. It's much more mechanical grip limited because it's such a slow, tight and twisty uh, track. So... The aero problems we suffer at most circuits don't necessarily affect them at Monaco anyway, but the biggest thing was the fact that Lewis was running a, a much slower pace. Um, I believe the, the Williams of George Russell, I heard this yesterday, lapped faster on the last lap of the race than Lewis did leading the race at the front. That shows you how much Lewis was backing off um, to, to, to get his tyres to the end of a race. So that's the reason it happened. What we have is we have a problem at most races where... The circuits that you can overtake on, which are much higher speed generally, have you know, overtaking opportunities, but the aero problems of following cars kick in and, and actually prevent us doing that. On a circuit where the aero problems don't affect the car so much, the circuit's so narrow, no one can overtake. So it's a really weird, uh, weird situation, that one. Um, right, final question then from Tuba Guy. 
Uh, do you think the drivers who live in Monaco have an advantage or disadvantage for this race? I don't think it really makes a big difference. And the only advantage that I could possibly see could be the fact that drivers who live there get to go and sleep in their own beds at night. And that, I guess, as we all know, those of us who travel, it's much nicer to sleep in your own bed than it is to be in a strange place, a hotel where you're just not quite as comfortable, not quite as home-like as it is back in your own room. So I guess there's a tiny potential advantage there. But on the flip side of that, I always think that when you have a situation that's anything other than the norm, Anything that you do slightly differently has the potential to upset your normal routine or your normal balance. So if you're not going back to the same hotel each night, if you're not staying in a hotel like you normally would at most racetracks, but you're going home, might be, maybe you've got friends there, maybe you've got family there, just slightly different, that always has the potential for me to upset the flow and upset the balance or the norm. Um, I don't think it really affects anybody. And to answer your question... I think the answer to the question is I don't think anybody has an advantage or disadvantage really if they live on, in Monaco or not. It's not like they're driving around Monaco in a Formula 1 car day in day out because they live there. So I don't think there's any advantage or disadvantage to be had whether you live there or not. Not in terms of racing. We'll just talk about tax reasons, that's a whole different, <laughs> different kettle of fish. But not when it comes to racing. <laughs> uh, right, that's it for the questions. Thank you very much. Loads of them. That's brilliant. Um, the kids have just popped out with Claire. So when they come back, we will pick a winner for the competition. So if you entered that, stay tuned. In just a moment, you'll find out if you're the guy who has won that brilliant Monaco artwork. Good luck. OK, so I have lined up all of the entrants, everybody who entered the competition using the hashtag GPBMON and all the other things I said. Share the video, link in with me, with the GP box uh, and all the, all the things I told you to do. Everyone who's done it, I've now got you all lined up on the computer here. My two special helpers here are going to help select a winner. Who's going to scroll and who's going to actually say stop? Scroll. Stop! You're going to say stop, you're going to scroll. Okay, so we're going to scroll all the way all the way down and then all the way back up again like this. So two fingers, so let's make it scroll. Just keep going back and forward all the way up and down. You're not allowed to look. Okay. And when you're ready, shout stop. You start scrolling, Ginger. Good luck, everybody. Go on then, start scrolling. When you're ready, Rex. Stop. Okay, that one there. George. You're, so I think that's Jorge. So Jorge's world. Um, let me just check that you have done everything I asked you to do. You have. Well done. Jorge's world. You've just won the awesome Monaco artwork, which I'll get into the post to you very, very soon. It says uh, over the next... George's world. I know, but it's pronounced Jorge, I think. I think. Jorge or George um, <laughs> world, May 26th. You have just won yourself. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. And Monaco, <laughs> Monaco Arwa. So well done yes. everybody, thanks very much for taking part. I uh, hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you're not subscribed to the channel yet, please do so and you won't miss another one. And we'll see you soon. Mm -hmm. Ta-da! Bye-bye! next time. Yes. <laughs>